Well, it is pre-trib rapture call-in day. I'm ready to take your calls with your best arguments for a pre-trib rapture. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Well, here we are on our first ever national pre-trib rapture call-in day. On this Tuesday, on the line of fire, Michael Brown, welcome to the broadcast. Here's the number to call, 866-348-7884. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Tuesdays, we focus on teaching, we focus on the Word, we focus on apologetics, theological controversies, and... I constantly I get asked, what's my view on pre-trib rapture? Now, the reason I'm asked about it all the time is because I don't talk about it all the time, and I've not divided over this, and I'm not going to divide over this with my brothers and sisters. So this is not a hostile broadcast. I am not uh, trying to, to push a view on you and rebuke you for not holding to this view I believe it's important that we believe rightly about the end times. I believe there are erroneous things we can hold to that can be harmful. But uh, there are people I work with around the world to this day. I do not know where they stand on the issue because it's never come up. Oh, you want to hear a shocker? There are colleagues of mine here, part of our leadership team at FIRE, and I don't know where they stand on this, and we haven't talked about it, and it's never been the slightest issue in years and years and years of ministry together. So if you want to make it an issue, and if you feel that if I do not hold to a pre-trib rapture, I'm in serious error, then come and give it your best shot. Just remember that with the force with which you present something, I will do my best to answer honestly and candidly based on Scripture. So 866-34-TRUTH. You say, man, there's a lot going on in the world. Why focus on this? Well, if we focused on it, that would mean we talk about it every day and that the main focus of this radio broadcast would be end-time prophecy teaching. But that's, that's not our calling, and I honor those who have that calling. But this is an important issue, and, and the Bible speaks a lot about the second coming of Jesus. And there are things that we are supposed to be doing in terms of our lifestyle, our mindset, looking forward to his coming in preparation for his coming. So I want to give you an opportunity to present your views. Now, I want to be honest. When I did the Calvinist call-in day, I heard from a good number of Calvinists, but I was expecting to hear from even more Calvinists as opposed to many who weren't Calvinists calling in and explaining why they weren't. Now, I took the calls because I wanted to be fair to our callers, but uh, I was expecting even better arguments from the Calvinist side and even more arguments and, and Dr. James White and I were interacting afterwards. He said, yeah, you had a lot of callers that weren't Calvinists. So I I will take calls by those who do not hold to a pre-trib rapture, but primarily I want to hear from those of you who do. I will not be nasty with you. Well, I'm not going to be nasty with anybody. I I won't embarrass you, all right? So even if you're not a theologian, even if you can't read a word of Hebrew or Greek, if you hold to these views, then— the door is open. The phones are open for you to call. When we come back, I'm going to give you my own history with pre rapture and a few reasons as to why I don't believe in it. As I have opportunity over the course of the broadcast, I will continue to share reasons why I personally do not hold to a pre rapture. Uh, one more thing. Please understand that I will not be able to let you give a five or ten minute presentation. But I want to hear from as many of you as possible. If you believe in a pre-trib rapture, especially if you think it's important for us to hold to that, the phone lines are open. 866-348-7884. Give it your best shot. Don't, Don't post on Facebook or tweet. Call me.
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right. We are about to dive into our pre-trib rapture call-in day. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, Thursday, the second hour, so some of you will get that live, some of you have to get that online. I will have as my guest, Messianic worship leader Paul Wilbur. We'll be talking about his latest CD project, playing some clips. Also, tomorrow I want to focus on the major moral social issues we're being confronted with, the battle for our children, the Supreme Court decisions coming soon regarding marriage. I want to talk to you about those things. And if you have not yet checked out our new TV program, uh, by God's grace, this launches July 10th, Wednesday nights on NRB TV. That means if you have Direct TV, if you have uh, uh, Sky Angel, I believe, you, you'll get to see it immediately. You can also watch online. You can watch with Android apps and other, other ways to watch. Uh, we start off in, in more than 32 million homes, uh, amazingly. And uh, we're going to start with a 32-week series, it so happens, on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. If you haven't checked out our video announcement about this with information so you can get involved and pray and get word out, go to AskDrBrown.org, and it's right there on the home page. You'll see a link to find out about the TV show. All right. Before I go to the phones, and you each give me a—you'll be able to give me your best argument— for pre-trib rapture, your strongest scripture. I was saved in a church that held to pre-trib rapture. That's what I learned. That's what I believed. That's what I taught. When I was saved, oh, a couple years, somebody asked me, one of my friends had a question about second coming. He was a believer. In fact, a fellow I'd led to the Lord in high school. And he asked me about the second coming. I said, you know, to be honest, I I don't, I don't really know a lot about the details when he pre, you know, had a really good question about something. Now, that was interesting because I'd read the Bible at that time cover to cover five times. I had memorized 4,000 verses. I used to memorize 20 verses a day. And, and you could ask me about almost anything I believed, and I could give you scores of verses, sometimes hundreds of verses, right off the top of my head as to why. But that wasn't the case with this. I thought I need to study more. So I got some of the best books on the subject, J. Dwight Pentecost, Things to Come, and the classic books by John Walvoord, and some of the early dispensationalist books, and W. Blackstone, Jesus is Coming, and many, many different books. And I read it, and I kind of mastered the system, and being my tendency then, became very, very dogmatic about what I believed, and taught it dogmatically and was sure that I had every I dotted, every T crossed, and people who didn't hold to this view were wrong. Okay, so I was narrow-minded about it, but that was part of who I was at that time. So anyway, when I was saved about four years, somebody gave me a book to read, and it claimed that pre-trib rapture teaching really had its origin in the 1830s, or, or between 1830s and 1860s, and that no one ever heard of it before that, and so on. Anyway, it just got me thinking. And I said, wait a second, wait a second. I didn't get this reading the Bible for myself. I got this reading books about a pre-trib rapture. And when I stepped back, I said, wait a second. It's, It's not there. It's not there. And there's no way you'd come up with it on your own, reading scripture on your own without anyone telling you from the outside. If that's your case, You came to all these views that there is a secret pre-trib rapture separated from the second coming. And and you you came to this not by hearing it taught in your church, not by reading it in the book, just by your own study of Scripture. You'd never heard of it. You thought you were the only one in the world who believed it and then found out this was common teaching. I would love to hear from you. Now, I want to be clear. Some of the finest believers in the world today and in past years have held to a pre-trib rapture. I want to be clear that my friends who hold to a pre-trib rapture think about the return of Jesus and talk about the return of Jesus far more than most others in the body, and yet this is a major theme in Scripture that we should be thinking about and talking about. At the same time, it is abundantly clear to me from Scripture that we are not looking for a secret event where Jesus stealthily takes us out and suddenly we disappear. Rather, we are waiting for his appearing. We will be changed when he appears. We will experience final 
deliverance when he appears. All the verses that are allegedly used to, to, or used to, to point to an alleged secret rapture speak about his return, which is actually a physical arrival, not almost getting here. They speak of his appearance. They speak of his revelation. All these things are visible and physical. And on top of that, when you look at when we're going to be changed, 1 Corinthians 15, it says the last trumpet. Well, we know Jesus is coming publicly, visibly with a trumpet blast. That's the last trumpet, friends. I mean, I worked it out that the last trumpet was not really the last trumpet and so on, but an honest reading of Scripture for me caused me to cease to be pre-trib, and I haven't been ever since. There are verses like in Isaiah 26 that tell us to come away and hide till God's wrath passes by. God will protect us from his wrath, but in this world, Jesus said it quite plainly, you will have tribulation. We can expect tribulation, testing, attack from Satan, from man, all kinds of a people right until the end of the age, but we will always be protected from God's wrath. All right, I will first take calls from those who hold to a pre-trib view. I hear from you all the time. You email me, you post on Facebook, you tweet. Now's the time to call 866-34-TRUTH. Let's start with George, City Island, New York. Thanks for calling the line of fire, sir. Thank you for your explanation of pre-trib rapture. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, however, I think the first century experience of the Thessalonians, who were really severely persecuted, Paul sums them up by saying they turned to God from idols, I'm quoting from the first chapter, to serve the living and true God and wait for his Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ, who delivers us from the wrath to come. I always think of the trib as wrath coming, and especially Jacob's trouble of wrath that is yet to come. And I believe the church will not go through that period with Jacob. So you straighten me out, doctor. You know better. <laughs> well, George, first, uh, I appreciate your spirit in, in this. That's the, the first thing. The second thing is, that verse is a verse that I used as well. Uh, Paul speaks of it in First Thessalonians uh, a couple of times. They were not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So here's my first question. How was that relevant for the, the Thessalonians that he was writing to? <clears throat> in other words, <clears throat> if, this was, <clears throat> if this was just a matter of escaping the, the Great Tribulation, how were those verses relevant to the Thessalonians who died now, it's clear, 2,000 years before any Great Tribulation? How would those verses be relevant? We haven't been well, appointed to wrath, but to obtain they, salvation. They were concerned with the terrible persecution they were undergoing. Many of them were, had lost their lives in this persecution when Paul wrote to them, mm -hmm. and feared that maybe the Lord had already come, as far as but he said they were to wait for him to come. Which no, 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 goes I, along I understand with that. what you say. No, but, but here's my point. Yeah. How they died 2,000 years ago, or 1,900 right. plus years ago, right? Yeah. So Paul said to them, they're not going to experience the coming wrath. Well, they died. Who cares? Why even say that? In other words, every generation that has read those words were not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Right. Well, th okay? their fear was that they were appointed to wrath. So many of them were being martyred. But, but, but what could be worse than that, that though? They but, thought that this was but, a terrible time. They had a misunderstanding, and Paul says, no. You're to wait for Jesus from heaven, who is the one who delivers you from that wrath, whether it's But what wrath would come. be worse than being killed? They were already being killed. Well, They're being killed being is nothing for us. We're going to be raised. We're going so, to be so why was it an issue Christ. for them, though? Why was it an issue for them? Well, they were fearful that the day of the Lord had come. In other words, that everything, all hell had broken loose. Their people were being slaughtered and killed and persecuted. And Paul says... No, this is not what's happening to you now. You are to wait for his the sun to c appear from heaven. You use the word appear. A appear, exactly. And, Se yeah, Second Thessalonians yes. 1, it says that they will be delivered, the Thessalonians will be delivered, right. when Jesus appears in blazing fire. Yes, taking vengeance taking on those who don't know God. Those who were evil exactly. So when is he going to appear in blazing fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God? When the day when is, of, when is, of wrath comes. 
No, no, no. When is when is for any of us? The day when of is ha- hang on, hang on. When is yeah. Jesus going to appear in blazing fire? Is that that's, his second that's coming? That's on his timetable. Whenever no, that no, no. I don't. I don't mean the date. Possibly, I, I mean it, it'll happen. Uh, no, 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 George, George. I don't. He, I don't mean his date. I don't mean the date. When he defends Israel. So that's at the uh, end the of the tribulation. Could come right after. We don't know. That's the end of the tribulation. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. that's when we get relief. Second Thessalonians one. I'll start there when we come back. We get relief when Jesus comes in blazing fire. The wrath we're delivered from is hell and final judgment. That's the wrath we're delivered from. All right, keep listening, George. We'll set the record straight. Thanks for getting us started. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us, friends, on this pre-trib rapture call-in day. Okay, now, I got a problem. We got a lot of callers on hold right now, but none of them are (laughs) pre-trib. Okay, so this is your day to call. This is your day to defend your position. I'm happy to spend the time explaining why I don't hold to a preacher rapture and giving the scripture reasons for it. I'm very happy to do that. I'm glad to do it. I want to give you the opportunity. Uh, don't, don't post a comment on Facebook that I can't reply to, especially in the midst of, of the show, or, or send a, a, a Twitter message and think that I'm going to be able to engage thousands of people uh, tweeting at the same time I'm doing the show and then and getting into a 140-character debate on Twitter. So this is your day to call. 866-34-TRUTH. So here's, here's the fundamental problem uh, with the position that was just graciously presented by our first caller. All right? <clears throat> number one, number one, the wrath that we are not appointed to is hell and final judgment. When Paul warns about the coming wrath, the coming wrath, the wrath that's coming on the sons of disobedience, why is he warning believers in the first century about it unless it's relevant to them? If I'm warning you about this coming earthquake 10,000 years from now, it doesn't affect you today. You'll be long gone. The wrath that, will, that is coming on the earth is the final judgment of God poured out on disobedient people. And we are not subject to that. That's the first thing. The second thing, so when it says we're not appointed to wrath but to obtain salvation, that that means the wrath of hell, the wrath of final judgment. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. We will be delivered. We will be caught up to meet the Lord. He will appear in the clouds. We will be caught up to meet him and changed. Paul says it's the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, in Revelation, the the 11th chapter, the seventh of seventh trumpets, also known as the last, right? The last of seven. That happens. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God. The the final collapse of Satan's kingdom and establishing of God's kingdom. That that is the the end. That is the end of the tribulation period, if you speak of it in in terms of a specific period. And the last trumpet is when we're changed. Well, when is the last trumpet blast? Matthew 24, when Jesus appears publicly for the whole world to see, and we are caught up in the clouds to meet him. And then we descend triumphantly together with him, rather than him secretly appearing, rapturing us out, even though he told us in this world we'd have tribulation. Rapturing us out, and then we feast in heaven for seven years while the Jews are slaughtered here on the earth. No, we're here together, serving, helping in the harvest to the last moment, Jesus appears in glory, we are caught up to meet him, and we descend together with him. That's when we are changed. I I want to quickly go to England. Uh, Derek in Worthing near London, thanks for calling, sir. Hi, Dr. Brown. It's Derek here, calling from the UK. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say um, that what a blessing your show is, and um, there's a few of us listening live over here. And um, your ministries have been a a blessing to us over here, and we're really grateful for it. And um, certainly the the recent 
uh, Calvin uh, phoning Calvin Calvinistic phoning show that you did. We uh, we enjoyed listening to that. Um, I recently I recently heard uh, Doctor White as well, James White over here when he was talking to um, having a, uh, a debate on Islam as well. So that that was really good, and it's good to know that you know him really well. But uh, I was I wanted to ask a question if that was okay. Surely. Um, do you ever get over to the UK? Because it would be great to to meet you. Um, do you ever get over here to minister? Um, yeah, you know I've I've be been nice. I've been over a good dozen or more times, just not in the last few years, but I'm really longing to get back over to the UK. We've got so many fine friends there. Uh, we've got our fire missions team over in Crewe doing a great job. You should get to know some of them with their church plant, really doing great outreach to, to very lost people. Uh, you can find out about them. Just go to fire-international.org. But it would be a joy to see you, and, and maybe you could help me with my accent. I would do so much better in <laughs> debates if I had a British accent. But, Derek, thanks for listening and calling, and, and tell your, your friends over in the U.K. We're, we're eager to meet them face-to-face, -face, okay? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for taking my call. I really appreciate it. You and, bet. Uh, keep up the good work. It, it's great. Thank you. All right, thank you. God bless. Friends, I, I think you can understand why I took a call from, from London, right outside of London. All right. Uh, let's go to Joshua in Boston. Thanks for calling the line of fire. How you doing? Very well, thank you. All right, my I, I do take a pre-tribulation stance, and my my reasoning is to look for Christ and for Him to come as a thief in the night uh, would make more sense because He could come at any any time. When when I look at it from this perspective rather than at the end of the tribulation when I see these things coming, because he said, you'll know I'm coming when you see these things happening. But if we're to go all the way through the tribulation, that means I, I no longer really have to wait for Christ. Um, I, I also believe this uh, in First Thessalonians, Paul says that after the, trib after the rapture, people will not have a chance who have heard the gospel to repent. Where does he say that? Um, hold on. It's in First Thessalonians. Yeah? Um, yeah. Feel sure about that? I'm, I'm pretty sure, unless I got like, incorrect <laughs> teaching. <laughs> no, it, it happens to the best of us, and sometimes we forget where something is. Yeah, I, I would say there's no such verse anywhere in Scripture. But you, you look for it for a moment, okay? Uh, okay. Now, just to respond to your point... Uh, a, a couple of things. Paul says to us in First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, that he's not coming like a thief in the night to us, right? And, and that, that we should not be overtaken with his coming as by a thief. That's judgment when he comes as a thief in the night. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, do you believe that the modern state of Israel needed to be restored before Jesus returned? That the, uh, the prof prophecies I, would indicate that. I believe, and I believe. Well, th this is this is my stance. I believe that the church would be raptured up, and the hundred and forty-four thousand Jews. No, no. Yeah, I understand that. But but gospel. do you believe, like my most dispensationalists, that the Jewish people had to be regathered to the land before Jesus will return? Um. Yeah. Yeah, All right, so, so that would mean then that there was a condition, that until that time, people who rightly understood Scripture could not be thinking Jesus was coming at any minute. But stay there, look, look during the break, try to find that verse you're looking for. Friends, we are so poised on the front lines, we are bursting with vision to touch this world and touch the Jewish people. Uh, stand with us, but, but I, I want to get in your hands one of the most important messages I ever preached called Politician, Professional, or Prophet. It'll, it'll shake you when you listen. It's yours for your gift of any size on an audio CD, along with my 5 by 7 card, 10 Commitments of a Jesus Revolutionary. So get this, you'll be ministered to, and you'll help us. 1-800-278-9978. 1-800-278-9978. Or order directly from AskDrBrown.org. It's The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. 
your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks so much for joining us today on this pre-trib rapture call-in day, 866-34-TRUTH. I'm asking you to call in with your your best reasons why you hold to a pre-trib rapture. We'll have friendly conversation. I haven't held to pre-trib rapture for over 35 years based on my study of Scripture, but I work with people who hold to it. I commend my pre-trib friends for making the second coming an issue and keeping uh, keeping it before us. I feel there's error in terms of saying that it's a secret event where we're, we're suddenly caught out before a tribulation period on the earth. I'm convinced that Scripture speaks of us being here until Jesus appears in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God, 2 Thessalonians 1. That's when our relief comes. We are longing for and waiting for what? We are longing for and waiting for His appearing, not for a secret event, but for his glorious appearing, which takes place at the last trumpet. And that's when we are changed. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, okay, Josh is still looking for that verse. So uh, stay there. Uh, let's go over to uh, Vicki in Silver Spring, Maryland. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Um, good evening. I have a question for you because I heard when the I was on the road and I just got in the house, and um, you were speaking about the gentleman who was reading from Thessalonians, and your point was that why would the Lord be saying, or why would the Scriptures be saying that, and that two thousand year has not um, happened yet? You know, they they're not even in that time period. But by the same token, the Scriptures said that they were waiting for Christ's appearance. You could use the same argument that you used for His point. Why would the Lord be saying what you're saying that was applied for? Because that has not happened for them yet. Ah, uh, okay. The same point. Wonderful and, question. And the, and the other point I wanted to make is um, because even when I'm reading the scriptures, I base because knowing the Lord, there is no place where He has not delivered His people. Mm-hmm. And when you look at how God has delivered His people um, during the time of the flood, even when He was dealing with the children of Israel the plagues, and they were in the land of Goshen. No loving father would allow his children to go through those torments, I don't believe. I'm a mother, and I would not allow my daughter to suffer all of that agony if it wasn't necessary. And remember, the Bible tells us that the day of the Lord is a day of vengeance, and we have not been called unto wrath. The Lord's day is not a day. The Scripture talks about it being it's a day of darkness, and we're already delivered from wrath. So I, right, so I believe so when I'm just making my last point that you can address me. Go um, ahead. So when we say that the Lord has delivered, so in the book of Thessalonians, when he's talking about we are delivered from the wrath to come, the day of the Lord is a day of vengeance. It is a day of wrath as well as hell. <laughs> okay. So Great. that's what I believe. All right, Vicki, good job on presenting your views. I appreciate it. Uh, so, so let me give you my response, but great job, and I appreciate the joy in your spirit as you present them. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start answering now, and I may have to finish uh, right after this break, okay? okay. But, but here we go. The first thing is, Paul said we are waiting for, we're longing for, looking for his appearing, right? But he didn't say to the Thessalonians, you are appointed to see his appearing, But he did say, you are not appointed to wrath. In other words, that was his word of encouragement to them, that you're not appointed to wrath. So you may see the wrath of man and attack and hatred like this, but you've been delivered from final judgment and hell. That's reality. So he didn't say, we are waiting for his appearing, and we're not expecting to experience wrath. He said, we are waiting, longing for his appearing, and we won't experience wrath wrath. You won't experience wrath. So the only way that's relevant to them is if it's talking about final hell and judgment. Here's the other thing. You mentioned the children of Israel in Goshen. God protected them while they were there. So here's the verse I look at. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the door behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. Of course, he'll protect us, but not by taking us out. Thank you. It's
It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to our first ever national pre-trib call-in day. Delighted to interact with you, hear your reasons for pre-trib rapture, and get my response as to why I don't hold to that. And at the end of the day, we're not going to divide over it because he's coming when he's coming, and we're doing everything we can to be ready at his appearing and to labor to glorify him until that day. 866-348-7884. I wrote a very important article, This Battle is for Your Children's Future. I'm going to be talking more about that tomorrow, but I really encourage you to go to my website, askdrbrown.org. Click on the latest article so you can, you can read that there. Uh, it's, it's important to know what's happening in our culture, in our society. And uh, please, when you visit the website, make sure you click right on the homepage to find out about our TV show that is scheduled to launch July 10th on national television, uh, Answering Your Toughest Questions. L- let me read the end of Isaiah 26. Isaiah 24 through 27, these are end time prophetic words. Isaiah 26, 20, go my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed on it. The earth will conceal its slain no longer. So there will be an outpouring of God's wrath on the earth that will be terrifying. No, but we are never, God's wrath is never for us believers. We'll be persecuted by people. The devil is out to attack us. But God's wrath is never for us as believers. So I believe in protection from the wrath to come. Uh, Hell, of course, delivered from that through the blood of Jesus, but also the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth. However, God makes it plain here how it's going to happen. Hide yourselves for a little while. He will protect us, and he calls us to hide ourselves for a little while as this is taking place on the earth. All right, quickly back to Joshua in Boston. Uh, You found your verse. Where is it? Yes, it's um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. and 3, he says, For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord. So comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Oh, okay. So that's, that's the verse that you thought was saying that there'll be no opportunity for people to repent uh, once Jesus returns with a secret rapture. First, it's the, the opposite of what that verse is saying. That's the first thing. He's talking about at the end, when the Lord comes in wrath, there's going to be deception on the earth and people thinking it's peace and safety. It's not, not, nothing to do with a, a secret rapture. It has to do with his public return and pouring out of wrath at the end of the age. So when people are saying peace and safety and, and everything's fine and, and all this stuff about God's not true and Jesus is, you know, all these things, he's saying, as they're saying peace and safety, that's when God is going to come with fierce judgment with the second coming that he then describes in, the, in 2 Thessalonians 1 as the Lord coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that don't know God. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing, he continues to say that that day will not overtake us as a thief. And then the third thing is that Revelation, the seventh chapter, if you want to hold to a a standard dispensationalist pre-trib view, it speaks of a multitude that no one can number being saved out of great tribulation. There's going to be a massive, massive harvest of souls, according to dispensationalists, during that time. So, again, it's, it's the exact opposite of what the verse says. So I'd encourage you to step back, reread First and Second Thessalonians with the understanding that Paul was encouraging them not to get worried about these things because Jesus was not going to appear until there was a final rebellion and the Antichrist revealed, according to Second Thessalonians 2. So anyway, that's your explanation. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for finding the verse. At least we could set the record straight there. All right, I, I'm going to get to some more pre-trib callers in a moment, but we've had some non-pre-trib callers holding for a long time. I want to give them a chance also. Uh, Frank in New Dorp, New York, thanks for calling the line of fire. Thank you, Michael. God bless you. Um, I'm going to give you some irrefutable verses to counter this. 
Wait, wait, hang, hang on, sure. Frank. J- j- just, just one second. I'm going to let you do that. Um, <laughs> I think Johnny misunderstood you because I'm looking at. I never heard of New Dorp, but you obviously said New York, huh? No, no, it's in Staten Island. New Dorp, New yes. Dorp in Staten Island. Yes. All right, good job, Johnny, in nailing that. Because when I heard your voice, I said, "Wait, this is Frank, our Catholic friend from Staten Island." All right, <laughs> go, go ahead. Just yeah, I'm going to give you go the for it as and, concisely as you can. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then I'm going to show you where it started, Michael. It didn't start in the 1860s. It started way before that, and people are going to be shocked where it started. But anyway, here's some of the verses. If you look at Matthew 13:30, at the end of the age, Jesus says to the angels, First, gather up the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them, but then gather the wheat into my barns. Verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age that angels shall come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. So they have it reversed. They have the righteous being raptured to heaven, but actually it's the wicked that are taken yep. out first, while the righteous are still here. Job 14:12. listen to this verse. So man lies down and does not rise until the heavens be no more. He will not awake or be aroused from his sleep. They have the resurrection of the dead and the rapture as it happening at the same moment but yet this says and that's the resurrection of the dead doesn't happen till the heavens be no more another problem with the with the uh the uh the judgments that were occurred in exodus 7 8 9 and 10 you have hail boils locusts frogs blood darkness are virtually identical to the judgments in the book of revelation and yet israel was still amongst egypt when those judgments fell that's all right, so Frank, yeah, all, all great points. Uh, I want to give folks other opportunity to call in. So just 30 seconds, where do you believe the origins of this were? Well, it started with a, a Jesuit priest named Emmanuel Akunza, whose pen name was Rabbi Ben Ezra. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, actually with Francisco Ribera, Ribera in 1558, another Jesuit priest, and Emmanuel Akunza wrote a book called The Coming of Messiah in Glory and Majesty in 1812. That book, Michael, was was translated into English by Edward Irving and picked up by John Darby and wound up, the teachings of it wound up in the Schofield Reference Bible. So these right. evangelicals who are teaching this pre-trib rapture are getting it from Catholic priests whom even the Vatican rejected. The Vatican never... All right. Now that, that's going to... Yeah, Frank, that, that's, that's going to get some evangelicals upset if they think they're teaching something that came from a Jesuit priest. Do me a favor. Shoot me an email uh, through the website with some of those references. All right, Frank, I very much appreciate it. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Carol in Miami. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Uh, Good afternoon, Dr. Brown. It's a very pleasure to uh, weigh in on the issue. Thank Uh, you. I am a free trip worker. I'm sorry, you were saying something? No, no, just thanking Uh, you for calling. Okay. I am a free trip uh, rapture, and the reason why that I believe that's because, uh, like the lady who called earlier, she made a few points, I believe, uh, the same way. Uh, not only the Israelites when they were in Egypt, but also even with the flood, we see that uh, God took out the wicked, and Noah was one of the just people in his family, and he spared them. Uh, I can see there is a pattern, as well as uh, when... He brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. He also took out Lot and his family. Mm-hmm. And I understand the gentleman that uh, 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 spoke earlier, Candidate, yeah, about uh, his view. And I understand, you know, with John Darby, probably in the 30s, came with the idea. But also I understand that scriptures is uh, uh, progressive. So, All right, so, so, so uh, let, me, let me ask this, though. What do you do with the fact that God poured out wrath on Egypt with Israel right there and just protected them. Why isn't that an option? And the verses I read from the end of Isaiah 26 when he said he's going to come to shake the whole earth and bring judgment, that he told his people who were there, uh, go hide uh, and before, until my wrath passes by. Why do you think that pattern is there? Isn't that at least another scriptural way that God could protect us right here in the midst of it? Yes, I believe it is, and I'm uh, also open to study new views, but as I've been believing free trip and I've been uh, checking scriptures to see, and uh, when I look at uh, uh, First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4, verse uh, 16 to 18, it, it, it speaks 
piece of that, as well as uh, First Corinthians fifteen fifty two. Oh, you know, oh yeah. Uh, so, so just to be clear, I'm a hundred percent sure that that's going to happen, that we're going to yes. be caught up to meet the Lord, and be changed. But it's going to happen according to First Corinthians fifteen, at the last trumpet, right? That's what Paul says. The last trumpet will be changed, will be transformed. The issue is though that the last trumpet, uh, according to Matthew 24, Jesus is coming for the whole world to see in judgment with a trumpet blast. So if the last trumpet is when we're caught up, that has to be the same time as that trumpet blast when he comes for the whole world to see, and that's when he gathers his elect together. Read 2 Thessalonians 1. Read it through a few times. When will we experience relief? when Jesus comes in flaming fire for the whole world to see. Thank you, sir, for the call. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us today on the Line of Fire, 866 for truth. I'm going to go back to the phones in one moment. First, let me read 2 Thessalonians 1. Paul comforting the believers in Thessalonica in the midst of their persecution. He says, verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen. What will happen? that he'll pay back those who trouble us as believers and give relief to those of us who are being troubled and persecuted. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. The answers I read many years ago when I was re-examining the issue of pre-trib rapture, the verses, uh, the, the commentaries I read on this, the explanations I read, all fell terribly short because it's, it's clear. It's, it's clear. Jesus will deliver us when he comes in flaming fire to punish the wicked. It's one and the same event. The rapture and second coming are one and the same event. Uh, Jake in Indianapolis, Indiana, thanks for calling the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, I wanted to thank you for sending me holy fire last time I talked to you. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, in Matthew 24, verse 34, Jesus said, This generation, it seems to be speaking of the generation he was speaking to, the apostles. And that his second coming was, um, what do I want to say, uh, when he came in judgment on Jerusalem in the clouds. Because when it says he comes in the clouds, the Old Testament was always judgment. So I'm not saying there's not a, a, a rapture. I'm saying that's the only event we're still waiting for, really. How, yeah, I, I appreciate. I appreciate. Or? No, I'm 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 post trib. If there is a seven year tribulation as opposed to a period of tribulation okay. described as seven years, that there's definitely future tribulation ahead of us. At the end of which Jesus returns, we're we're caught up to meet him in the air and descend together with him. He establishes his kingdom on the earth. So I'm premillennial. But okay. my problem with the preterist or partial preterist reading is, is this. Number one, the imagery is so far beyond what happened uh, with the destruction of Jerusalem. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. To me, there's no possible way, even using Old Testament imagery, you can say that refers to the a destruction of Jerusalem in year 70. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. That can't work. If you say, well, angels just mean messengers and it's apostles, There's, still it doesn't, it doesn't work. So either he's talking about the generation that sees certain signs in that time will see the destruction of Jerusalem in his day, 
but then there's a future application. Or he's talking about the generation that sees these final things happen. Um, And that's why he then says, verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And he goes on to talk about what's going to happen there. So clearly, when the New Testament is looking forward to the coming of the Lord and looking forward to his return, and Paul saying we're going to be transformed, and so on and so forth, and then Paul also making plain this happens when he returns in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. I see no possible way that the preterist reading of, of Matthew 24, that the second coming and wrath and judgment already happened in 70. I see no possible way that can be supported by the text. But thank you, sir, for the call. I do appreciate it. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, John in Culver, South Carolina, thanks for calling the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, this is John from Culver. Can you hear me? I can hear you, John from Culver. Great. Well, actually, Clover, we're, we attend your church, and uh, I've got the four kids, and we called in a week or so ago. So I um, just wanted to call in because it's funny you're on this topic. I've been looking at this recently in my studies, and um, uh, my wife just told me that you were talking about it, so she said, why don't you call in? So um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to call in and, and just share what's this thought, um, you know, I've always kind of leaned toward post-trip, although I have found some compelling arguments to the contrary. Um, not that I want to go through the tribulation, but uh, there is an interesting source that I've been listening to, and I know you don't have a chance to vet this. Yeah, tell you what, business. you got it. We're short on time, so I got to get you to jump right to the point. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, we have precedent for uh, extra biblical references in the Bible, at least to be supportive, like Acts 17:28, where Paul said, "As certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring." So Paul was actually referencing poetry to support his doctrinal position. And all I'm suggesting is that in many of the New Age writings that are coming through different sources like channeling people and the, all of the uh, concepts that you see with aliens and UFOs, all of this kind of doctrine that's all tied to the occult, the New Age, and it's all anti All right, so, so i, I got to jump in because we're, okay. we're out of time. So you're saying that, that because there are pagan parallels for pre trib rapture, we should consider it? No, what I'm suggesting is that in, in, in all of their doctrines, so to speak, they are pushing the fact that there is going to be something like a rapture where 20 million people disappear off the earth, and they're explaining it away as something else. Uh, all right, yeah, the, the better way to approach that, John, if that's the case, that's a further proof of deception. In other words, the fact that Paul quotes one poet uh, is simply saying he happened to be right on that, but Paul warns perpetually about the deception of the world, and in that very chapter tells everyone you're in darkness so repent. So I come to the exact opposite conclusion. That would be manifestation of the deception, not proof of its truth. But interesting thought. I appreciate it. All right, friends, stay on the line. I'm going to continue to take your calls in the next hour, 866-34-TRUTH. We just had a phone line open, so dive in if you like, 866-348-7884. Stand with us, friends, and take advantage of this week's special offer. You will be impacted, you will be heavily impacted in hopefully a life-changing way by my audio message, politician, professional, or prophet. It's yours for your gift of any size on an audio CD. We will also enclose with it my 5x7 card, 10 Commitments of a Jesus Revolutionary. It's also a great gift for your pastor or congregational leader. Call 1-800-278-9978. 1-800-278-9978. 9978. One more time, 1 800 278 9978. My bottom line today let us unite around the fact that we are longing for the return of the Lord and that now is our time to make a lasting impact for Him and to be ready for His return. Well, it is pre-trib rapture call-in day. I'm ready to take your calls with your best arguments for a pre-trib rapture. 
It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on today's first ever national pre-trib rapture call in day. We've had a good, lively first hour. I look forward to a good, lively second hour. I'm, I'm sure other stations, broadcast shows have done things that were similar. However, however, in point of fact, uh, this is my first ever national call in pre-trib rapture day. So, Feel free to call in with your best reasons as to why you hold to a pre-trib rapture. I've not held to that for over 35 years, and I've not met anyone yet who, through their own study of Scripture, without being taught this by someone else, concluded that the rapture was separate from the second coming, that one was an invisible event where we would secretly be caught out, and seven years later there would be a physical, visible return of Jesus. I've never met anyone that just learned that from the scriptures themselves. I was taught it. I read books that taught me that. However, I have not met anyone that just studied the scriptures because the scripture doesn't separate a rapture and second coming in terms of terminology. I've still not met anyone who learned this on their own. Someone taught them the system and then they found scripture to support it. Many of the finest believers on the planet today hold to a pre-trib rapture. Some of my, my good friends through the years have held to a pre-trib rapture. I work with folks around the world that probably hold to it, and I don't know if they hold to it or not. In fact, as I think of it, my dear friend Yesu Padam that I work with in India, that I've worked with now for over 20 years, one of my dearest friends in the entire world, we've worked side by side in life-threatening situations and on and on and on. I don't even know where he stands on this. I don't know if he knows where I stand on it because it just never come up. So I'm saying it doesn't have to come up, and it certainly doesn't have to divide us. If we say we should live in readiness of the Lord's return, we should believe that God will protect us from whatever comes in this world, that, that he did, Jesus did tell us in this world we'll have tribulation. Revelation, the first chapter, Revelation, the first chapter is plainly written there that John, he says, I'm your companion in the kingdom and glory and tribulation. He puts tribulation right in the middle the, the, the patient endurance that we have here. So we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have opposition. We are protected from God's wrath. Jesus returns at the end of the age. What we're looking forward to, look through all the scriptures. We're waiting for his appearing. We're looking for his visible return. So in that light, I want to hear from you. Uh, Now, again, I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg in terms of why I do not hold to a pre-trib rapture. Uh, I am premillennial. I do believe that Jesus will return to this earth and establish his kingdom on the earth, and there will be a glorious 1,000-year reign on the earth, at the end of which there will be a further rebellion of human beings who will then be utterly destroyed and will enter into the eternal age. But I don't divide over that either. What's important to me is that we believe in the return of Jesus and preach it, that we live not with focus on the when, but the what. The New Testament emphasis is not primarily on the when of his return, but the what, the glory, and how we will be transformed, and how it says in 1 John, everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he is pure. So that's what we're looking forward to. That's what's important to me, and it is also important that we preach the return of Jesus and recognize the urgency of world mission and the urgency of standing with Israel for the salvation of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those things are important to me. Other things we can differ on. I'll be back and go right to your calls. Stay with us.
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. You know, I I, uh, I live in the Line of Fire, actually. No, I, I don't mean that all I think about is the radio show, although ministering to you on radio five days a week, two hours a day is, is one of the great highlights and joys of my life and one of the greatest privileges I have as his servant. But <laughs> you know, I wrote an article taking issue with Pastor MacArthur on some of his stance with the Strange Fire Conference, probably agreeing with so many of the things that he says are Strange Fire, but, but disagreeing with his wholesale rejection of so many of the things the Holy Spirit is doing around the world. So you write an article like that, I posted it online. It's gotten, oh, thousands and thousands of responses and shares and so on. But uh, I, I take the time to respond to someone that writes a lengthy critique. Just to, to I can't do this 99.9% of the time, but I take the time to do that. And, and what happens? <laughs> get, get blasted for, for being condescending. So it's just, I just saw some tweets to that effect. So God bless those folks. That's what happens when you try to take time to reach out and interact. But it's all worth it. It's all worth it. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Michael in Santa Cruz, California. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hello, Dr. Brown. My name is Mike, as you know. Yes, sir. And uh, I'll give you my background. I was born and raised as a Jehovah's Witness, and I just left. I became a Christian. And uh, my biggest issue with Christianity was this whole issue with pre-trib rapture. I'd never found it in the, to be in the Bible. And mm-hmm. as I was a witness, I was trained to debunk this. Like, it's not scripture, it's Mark. In Mark 13, Christ clearly says, after the great tribulation will return. My question is, why is this so prevalent in the church today? Yeah, Michael, that's, that's a very fair question. On, on the one hand, you realize, of course, that you can't judge truth or falsity by how prevalent or scarce something is. Of course, you understand that, but it's a very fair question. Why uh, were books like Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey bestsellers or the Left Behind series by Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye such bestsellers? Uh, Why did millions and millions and millions and millions of people read these books and many people got saved through them? What, What I'd say is this, that there is something of truth that was picked up by the the pre-trib teachers. There was something of truth in terms of getting us to focus on the return of Jesus and live with a sense of of readiness at his return. That uh, even the recognition that God was going to restore the Jewish people back to the land and that these were part of the things unfolding in the final generations before Jesus returned, they were preaching these things long before they happened. So I would simply say that that there's a certain truth to the message. Uh, I, I think each side has a certain truth. I think the, the, the post-millennial side has a truth. The amillennial side has a truth. The premillennial side has a truth. And even though I come down on one point, I believe each, each viewpoint is based on certain scriptures. So what I find in pre-trib circles is suddenly there's this realization that Jesus is coming back and even though it can be taught in superficial ways, like you could be here any moment, and, and if suddenly the, the phone lines go dead or you don't hear someone talking, and, you know, or, or all the you know, thief in the night type of movies and you're driving your car and suddenly the car is crashing and no one's there, and you know, the sensationalized and cheapened ways that these things could be taught, uh, that's, that's a problem. And the escapist mentality some have, or the idea that, hey, I don't have to worry about certain things because Jesus is coming at any moment, that, that's a, a bad application of it. But it has been used by God in the midst of what I believe is some error to get people really thinking about the return of Jesus, because otherwise we kind of act as if we're here forever. And, and if that could just be coupled now with the rest of the message as to the nature of his return at the end of this age in flaming fire, as you say, after the tribulation unfolds, then I think it could be all the more effective. So I'd rejoice in the good that it's done to get us thinking about the return of Jesus and recognizing the prophetic importance of the return of Israel and so on, and feeling a sense of urgency uh, to work while it's yet light. On the flip side, we have to address the error for what it is. But Michael, I'm so glad you made your way out of Jehovah's Witnesses and found a true knowledge of the Lord. I've got a 30-second question for you. How long were you Jehovah's Witness? 
your whole about life. 20, uh, 25 years. All right. So, so you worked hard, but you never had assurance of forgiveness of sins and being a child of God. Would that be an accurate statement? Very true. Actually, you just interviewed, my friend interviewed you a couple months back, Augustine Astacio. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. That. Okay, That's great. Of well, wonderful. <laughs> Michael, keep up the good work. Keep enjoying the Lord and making him known to others. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Anne in Manhattan. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Thank you for taking my call, Dr. Brown. Um, I, I'm pre-trib, and I've, I've, well, I've studied the, um, from the Ariel Ministries. They're pre-trib, but I have, I have a question. In Isaiah 26, um, verse 19, right before the go my people enter your rooms, it speaks of the revivication of the dead. May your dead come to life. May my corpse arise. Awake and shout for joy, you who rest in the dirt, for your do is like to do, which will be revived on and on. So to me, I'd like to know why in that verse does it talk, speak of the revivification of the dead before we're to go in our rooms and rest. It sounds to me like the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then in Isaiah um, 57, 1, I don't understand where it says, the righteous one perishes and no man takes it to heart. Men of kindness are gathered in with no one understanding that because of the impending evil and the righteous one was gathered in. He will come in peace. They will mm-hmm. rest in the resting place on and on. So those two verses I've been taught are a sign of the rapture. And in keeping with the, uh, the ancient Jewish, Jewish wedding, we would be taken into a room. I, you know what I'm saying. Right, right. Okay, so uh, th- three points. The first one is Isaiah 24 through 27. It starts off with wrath. That, mm-hmm. that, that's the beginning, outpouring of wrath. Right. Uh, before any mention of resurrection. So that's the first thing. If, if you're going to be chronological, then wrath comes first. So wrath the comes first. whole world say, right, that's the first thing. Mm-hmm. The second thing is, in, in a passage like that, it's giving a large picture, and it can be, it's presenting things that are not necessarily in chronological order. But if, you, if you're going to argue chronologically, wrath comes first before resurrection. Okay. That's the first mm-hmm. thing. The second mm-hmm. thing, Isaiah 57, is, is not talking about a pre-trib rapture. It's, it's talking about sometimes that a godly person would die, and no one could understand why. Like King Josiah gets oh. cut down at the age of 39 uh, after reigning for 31 years. Well, he doesn't live to see the tragedy of his own nation going into exile and the horrific suffering that came. Or if you look, for example, in uh, old Second Kings, the 14th chapter, you've got an ungodly king, and he's mm-hmm. got a kid who's sick, and God says that kid's going to die young, to be taken out of the way, basically. That would, that would be an application for Isaiah 57. So it's saying sometimes there's, it, it could almost be like someone that's about to experience Holocaust or genocide in their country, and they mm-hmm. die in a freak car accident, and they're gone, but it was mercy, so mm-hmm. they wouldn't have to experience what was uh, uh, going to happen. So, I see. so uh, are we not as, to... as for the, 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 uh, the bridal yes, paradigm. Yes, the bridal theory. You know that yeah, theory. Yeah, here's how it works. It works the opposite. Mm-hmm. What would happen would be this, that when the uh, announcement was made that the, the groom was coming, that mm-hmm. the bridesmaids would, be, mm-hmm. would, would then gather together, it would be an entourage that would then come out to meet him as he was making his way to the wedding, okay? okay. And they mm-hmm. would escort him back. So mm-hmm. he did not meet them and go all the way back somewhere. No, no, this is on oh. his way to the wedding, we are caught up, uh, in this case, speaking of the return of Jesus, we are caught up to meet him as he returns, and now we descend to earth with him. So the whole mm-hmm. world sees Jesus appearing. We are caught up in front of the whole world uh, mm-hmm. to be with him, and we escort him back. That's, that's the Jewish marital paradigm uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's hinted at in Matthew 25. So it's, it's actually the opposite. It works completely against a pre-trib viewpoint. Oh, that's beautiful, though. That's beautiful. We're it is. It's, it's, glor- it's, it's glorious, right? And we, yes. we accompany him back. Yeah, and thank you for the thank call. You. I appreciate it. And there are many, many fine things you learned from the ministry. You're, you, know, you mentioned many, many fine, wonderful things. We just differ on some like this. 866-348-7884. Uh, Jason in Silver Springs, you've been... All right. I, I want Jason held, held for a long time to get his post-trib view in. But we will not get to it. He couldn't hold any longer. All right, I want to get your pre-trib calls. Our lines are lit up with pre-trib callers. I'll be talking to you as soon as we come back. Please take a minute. Visit my website, askdrbrown.org. 
askdrbrown.org. Click on the latest article to read about this battle is for your children. You want to know what's happening in society. We'll talk about that more tomorrow on the air as well. And if you've not yet clicked on the video to find out about my TV show, how you can watch it around the country beginning July 10th, how you can help. We do need your help and support to move this forward. Please go to my website, askdrbrown.org. And when you get there, just right on the homepage, you will see TV. We're going national. Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, let me go straight to the phones on this pre-trib rapture call in day. Tuesdays, we focus on teaching the word, theology, theological controversies. And we are having a discussion as brothers and sisters in the Lord. I want you to consider why I don't hold to pre-trib rapture. I want you to give me your reasons as to why you hold to it or raise questions about it. But this is not for the purpose of of dividing or, or, to be honest with you, I'm not even trying to convince you of my viewpoint. I'm sharing reasons why, but I'm not trying to convince you of my viewpoint as much as to say, think about these things, look at them, and let's continue to labor together before the Lord. Back to the phones. Anna in the Bronx, thanks for calling the line of fire. Hi, Mike Brown. Hello. Um, God bless you. Um, yes, I'm also a pre-trip. Uh, I've been believing the Lord over 30 years, and this is the way I was raised to believe. And I just want to throw a question at you, and then I'll just um, hang up and just listen, because I've been listening to the radio station. And my husband tells me, he must be Jewish, so he must know. <laughs> So anyway, it's Revelation 19.20 where it says, And the evil creation was captured, and with him the false prophet who could do mighty miracles when the evil creature was present. So it talks about the mark of the beast. So what I wanted to know was, if we're going to be here for that, um, we're going to have the mark of the beast? Is that my, That's my question. And um, how are we going to purchase the food and everything else? Because it says if you have that mark, ah. at least you can't uh, purchase anything. So that, that's basically my question. All right. And Anna, stay. Uh, I have you on hold. Keep listening on hold, because if you're listening in New York City, we're only on for the first hour. So in case you're, you're not listening on your computer, you can, you can just listen on hold on the phone right now. The first question with the book of Revelation is, is it entirely speaking of future events? Is it entirely speaking about future events? In other words, wasn't it written for believers in the first century? Doesn't it have relevance for them? So what would be the relevance for them? I believe it has to have relevance for those who read it in the first century, and then relevance for every generation, and perhaps special relevance as well for those who live right at the time that Jesus returns. But since thus far... None of us have been in the system of a worldwide antichrist with a mark of the beast where you can't buy or sell uh, without uh, without that. Then that that would indicate to me that either this is something that had no relevance for anyone up until now, or perhaps it's talking about oppressive world rule. It could have had application in Roman days. It could have had application in, in communist China and other places. In fact. I've read this, that, that believers in communist China were very upset with the missionaries who taught, taught a pre-trib rapture because when all hell broke loose on them and they came under this oppressive, horrific system, they thought we, we were told we were going to be out before this happened, before anything like this ever happened, and, and here it's happening. So the one thing is you can read it all spiritually, and it's talking about the oppressive world systems or governments that will cause everyone to conform to their ways or else. And we've experienced that, Anna, for centuries. And we have had to choose between obedience to God and our very own lives through the centuries. So that's one thing. It could have that spiritual application. If, in fact, it is speaking about an end-time worldwide reign of an Antichrist figure, and you can only uh, buy or sell 
with his mark, that's going to mean all hell breaking loose against us, God's people, and God having to keep us and protect us because we will not submit to the beast. But remember, Revelation 7 speaks of a multitude that no one can number coming out of a time of great tribulation. It speaks symbolically of 144,000 Jews, which I take to mean the fullness of the harvest of Israel. So Jews being saved from, from every nation, and uh, from every tribe in a complete and full way, meaning that there, there are hundreds of millions of believers on the earth as these things are happening. So it doesn't mean that everyone's going to submit. It means that's going to be what the world puts on us, and we're going to have to depend on God in the midst of it. And if you say, well, I can't believe that'll ever happen to me. Well, it's going to happen to brothers and sisters somehow because there's a multitude no one could number saved out of great tribulation. And if you say that great tribulation means that seven-year period, that's when they get saved. All right, Anna, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. 866 truth Let's go to Joan in Queens, New York. Thanks for calling the line of fire. God bless you, Dr. Brown. How are you doing today, sir? Very well. Thank you. Wonderful. I am pre-trib. I was raised pre-tribulation. Uh, because of my foundation, I was I was uh, saved under Pentecostal ministry, taught the yep. Bible and the Word of God under uh, uh, you know under the uh, holiness banner and of course a pre-trib uh, uh, doctrine, and I hold to it. I still believe it, and I don't want to be redundant by giving you all the same scriptures that so many people have given. You know, because I've been listening uh, since the uh, first hour on uh, five seventy in New York mm-hmm. City. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is because, you know, I'm, I love to study the Word. I'm a student of the Word. I love all your material. Can you give me some material so that I can further study and research? Because I want truth. I, it's not that I'm going to hold on to what I've had all my life. Yeah. Like you, you held on to the view, you know, uh, 35 years ago, and then, you know, you transitioned. So my question to you is, can you give me some material that, so that I can study this on my own, search the Scriptures, and also you know, um, come to my own conclusion based on the Word of God, not my own thinking of what I feel, but on God's Word so that I can, you know, basically be able to understand better yeah. whether I should be free or post-trip. Yeah, and, and Joanne, of course, that's, that's my heart as well for my whole life. Here's what I'm going to do. I, I am actually, in the next few days, uh, just going to put together some recommended resources that I'll put on my blog, on my Ask Dr. Brown page, and then I'll, I'll announce it on radio, and I'll post it on Facebook, and I'll tweet it out, etc. So uh, some recommended resources. I, I did read a number of books back in those earlier days when I was debating these issues myself, uh, but it was basically just looking at the word, especially looking at the, the original, uh, the, the Greek words that are used. So just one quick word of advice, Joan. Look at the, the, the primary Greek words that are used to describe the return of Jesus, actually his return, the parousia, his, his uh, uh, appearing or shining forth, his epiphania, his revealing uh, apocalypse, all of these speak of something public that the whole world can see visible and an actual physical return. The parousia is, is a visit to a place and ask how any of those could refer to a pre-trib rapture. And yet it's all those things that we are looking forward to. So do a study of the word appearing, coming, revealing, with reference to the second coming, and that's going to help you more than anything else. 866-34-TRUTH. I will be back with your calls right on the other side of the break. Would you like to listen to a message that will rivet you and stir you and put holy backbone and courage in you? Get my audio CD, Politician, Professional, or Prophet. Listen to it. Be stirred by it. If you have a pastor, a friend in ministry, get it to them. They will be helped by it as well. And we'll send you with it my 5 by 7 card, uh, five, uh, excuse me, 10 commitments of a Jesus revolutionary that you'll find practical and really helpful. The CD, the card with the 10 commitments, yours for gift of any size. So thank you for standing with us. 1-800-278-9978, the number to call. 1-800-278-9978, or just go to askdrbrown.org. It's the Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. 
Okay, I've, I've got a practical question. <clears throat> got a practical question. 866-34-TRUTH. Michael Brown here. And just in case my dear bride is listening, <clears throat> she would make sure I cleared my throat. All right. Pre-trib rapture call-in day. Our phones are lit up. We've been taking calls for an hour and a half now. We're going to take calls for another half hour and interact with you and find out why you hold to a pre-trib rapture. But I, I, I don't, and I'm not dividing over this, but I'm giving you an opportunity to share your views. Here's my question for you. If you hold to a pre-trib rapture and you're wrong about the theology, how would that hurt you? If you hold to, say, a post-trib rapture, if you hold to a seven-year tribulation period, which I know not all of you do, or not all of you are premillennial, but let's just say you hold to a post-trib view and you're wrong, how would that affect you? Now, now, here's the bottom line for me. I'm not living a certain way just in case Jesus comes any moment. I'm living a certain way because I want to please the Lord and love him and honor him. And no one knows the day of their death, the moment of their death, so we should always be ready to meet the Lord in that respect. We, we don't want to be caught doing something that we'd be ashamed of if he returned. But if the pre-trib rapture is wrong, what would be the negative effects of believing in that? If a post-trib rapture is wrong and you're, you're living in readiness for the Lord's appearance, what, what harm is there potentially? You just get caught up earlier than you expect it. But many have held to a pre-trib rapture and made foolish choices because of it, like those who went for the 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988, or the Harold Camping deception that, that spread in certain circles a few years back, you know, culminating, what was it, last year? Uh, and, and as I mentioned in the last half hour, there were Chinese Christians who were taught by the missionaries in the, the beginning of the 20th century, that there'd be a pre-trib rapture and so on. And then when communism came and all hell broke loose against them, they were very upset and hurt. And they, they said, uh, you know, to the missionaries, many of them left, of course, you told us we wouldn't have to go through this because it, it was all hell breaking loose on them. So I see potential problems for believing this. I mean, the biggest question is what does Scripture say? But I see potential problems for believing in a pre-trib rapture if the Word doesn't teach it. I don't see potential problems believing in a post-trib rapture if the world word doesn't teach it. Because either way, we should be living in anticipation of the Lord's return. And the big emphasis of the New Testament is not the when of his return, but the what of his return. Dwight in Durham, North Carolina, thanks for calling the line of fire. Hey, how you doing, Dr. Brown? Very well, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't raised up with pre trib I got saved in uh, 1983 in the Army. Um, someone handed me the book, um, Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth. Yep. And that changed my life. And um, a little while back, kind of backslid a little while back, but when I started thinking about the pre-trib and all that, that helped bring me back. So I'm not going to give you, like I said, all the scriptures that people have probably, you know, bring up about that. I'm going to give you what I feel that is scripture and why I think it, it, it kind of refutes the post out of love and, and it helps us to um, to encourage all of us knowing that Christ can come. It's imminent. Okay. Um, you say, um, now, you believe in the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ when he comes at his second advent. Second coming. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he, set, he sets that up on earth. Yes, sir. Okay, um, and I and I believe that too. You know, pre trib we hope we hope we, we believe that too. Christ yes, absolutely. Up. Hey, hey, up. Dwight, listen, we we've got a break first. I'm so glad that the Lord used late great planet Earth to touch you, and many people were saved through that book. And I believe it's because it brought a reality that the Bible was relevant and speaking to our age, and God was at work in history. And it emphasized the return of Jesus. But let us keep our eyes focused on the King, my dear brother, and let us live in readiness and eagerness for his appearing. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. 
Thanks for joining us on our pre-trib rapture call in day. Oh, let, let me read a, a beautiful scripture. Many of you know it from 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. Paul writes this, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Unfortunately, with the pre-trib rapture, people are longing for not his appearing, but a thief in the night event where he secretly takes us out and we disappear. We are to be longing not for that, but for his appearing. When he appears, we will be changed. In fact, let me, let me share also what it says in 1 John, uh, the third chapter. He writes this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When? When he appears. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Back to the phones. Gregory in Pearl River, Louisiana. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hi, I'd like to mention a couple phrases that we could look at. Sure. One, uh, one's in Revelation and one's in Second uh, Thessalonians. But in Revelation, we're familiar with the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And when you look at the first few chapters of Revelation, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm-hmm. So as you progress through the book, later on it sounds like the same thing we hear in the Gospel. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says, but it no longer says to the church. And there's really no mention of the church from roughly Revelation 6 to Revelation 19. And then another thing I'd like to talk about is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Yeah. Uh, in, in many of our modern translations, it says, um, you know, the apostasy must first come, and, and yep. then the Antichrist will come. But if you look at some older Bibles, Wycliffe Bible, Geneva Bible, it talks about a departing away, or a catching up. So, you know, there's debate with Greek scholars. I'm a pastor of a church in Slidell, Louisiana, so there's a debate as to whether it means catching up, departing away, or if it's referring to falling away of the church. So I think we definitely have some examples of, of, of an Enoch or Elijah phenomena where people can be caught up, and translated that right. the spirit of God can move people. Philip the evangelist was was moved after he witnessed yeah, the no, Eucharist. No argument with that part. So so a, a couple of questions for you, okay? And okay. whatever's going on in the background, I don't know if you guys got to turn that down because when I speak, I can't hear. All right, so just got to put you on hold. I'll bring you back on uh, after I make my points, Gregory. Uh, number one. There's really not a debate in the Greek lexicons in terms of the meaning of apostasia. If, if you look at all of the, the major Greek dictionaries by people who didn't have an axe to grind in this, you'll find there's really not a, a difference of opinion in terms of does this refer to some type of, of catching away. That's the, that's the first thing in terms of Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. It does mean apostasy, but even if you weren't sure, it says that day will not come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's part of what he's telling them. So he's saying, until that happens, until you see the man of lawlessness revealed, don't worry that the day of the Lord's coming. Oh, we missed it. Something happened. No, no. He's saying the opposite. That no, no way, no how. He's already told them in Second Thessalonians, the first chapter, that relief will come to them when Jesus comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. So that's what they were waiting for. And now he's reiterating that. Even if you had a question mark about the meaning of ap- apostasia in Second Thessalonians 2, 3, which really, like I said, check out all the major Greek lexicons. It's not a conspiracy that they, they understand it the way they do. But that's part of Paul's whole sentence. Until blank occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Why is he telling them that? He's telling them you haven't seen it happen yet, therefore you know we're, you haven't missed it. As, as for the, the references to the, the churches, the believers, 
Well, he's talking to their messages to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. But throughout the rest of Revelation 4 right till the end, there are references to, to, to believers on the earth. So the question for you is, since there's only one church, only one people of God, only one ecclesia, which is Jew and Gentile for all ages, joined together in Jesus, all those who are saved in the tribulation, who are they? Where do they go? If they're not part of us, the multitude no one could number, and so on. So, so number one, the Greek is against you in 2 Thessalonians 2. The context is explicitly against you. 2 Thessalonians 1 adds to it being completely against you because the, what we're waiting for is, is what Paul writes here, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. He's just told them a few verses earlier in the first chapter, we're waiting for that glorious coming. And now he's telling us it's going to happen after the wicked one is revealed, and that's when Jesus will come and destroy him. So um, I, I appreciate the the arguments, but I think they're all easily answered based on scripture. So back to you. You can get the last word in before I take another call. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, well, the people who wrote the left behind books and so forth, uh, we can split hairs over the Greeks. I think over the Greek language that there's people who would endorse the position I'm giving, but just in general, uh, book of revelation a lot of those things have not happened yet the, the preterist view says uh, you know a lot of these things already happened in, in the past and we haven't had earthquakes that have destroyed one-third of the cities of the world and one-third of the water been wiped out and a lot of these things haven't happened and we have different dispensations we, we have believers in a cloud of witnesses in heaven we have believers on earth um but, but aren't they all part of the ecclesia Surely. We're, we're all part of the same spiritual family. So if you're going to argue, yeah, and, and I've, I've just got to, i got to put you back on hold. The way you've got your radio on uh, or the handset is really loud, every word I say is bouncing back for our listeners. So forgive me for not uh, allowing you to interact with me here, okay? But we're really not splitting hairs on the Greek. Check, check all of the major lexicons on this. That's number one. Number two, Read through Second Thessalonians 1 and 2. Just read it over and over and over and over. And you'll see what we're looking forward to is Jesus returning in blazing fire. And that takes place in judgment on the Antichrist and so on. And number three, I'm not a preterist in any way. I'm absolutely looking forward to the return of the Lord. I'm absolutely looking forward to his kingdom on the earth. I believe we're living in prophetically urgent days. So I'm, I'm with you step for step on so many of these things. But it's to separating the people of God and saying that ecclesia only means those saved during this period of time. Oh, absolutely not. The ecclesia is all those who were saved in the past, Abraham and, and, and others like that, and those who will be saved right until the Lord comes in flaming fire. And lastly, we do have precedents of people being taken out, and we have precedents like the children of Israel in Egypt. Wrath is poured out, but they were supernaturally protected. Check out the end of Isaiah 26 on that, and brother, keep preaching Jesus and lifting him up there in Louisiana. Appreciate it. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Betsy in San Diego. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Thank you for taking my call, Dr. Brown. I think I confused your uh, screener a little bit, so I told him that I would try to be a little bit more um, concise in my question. Sure. Really based on uh, Daniel 12, verses 9 and 13. Um, Daniel is told, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed the words are closed up and sealed until the end of t- until the time of the end. And verse thirteen says, But go thy way till the end, for you shall rest and stand in your lot in the end of the days. So my question is, according to uh, Paul in first and second Thessalonians, why do we feel like we have to believe everything is going to take place, and then there's still a thousand years left after that. Ah, great question. The, the answer would be because God promised certain things would happen on the earth, and Peter in Acts, the third chapter, said that Jesus must remain in heaven until the time for the restoration of all things spoken of by the prophets. 
and the prophets spoke about things that would happen on this earth and the glory of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the seas and spoke of, of Israel in the center of what God's blessings would be. And those things haven't happened. So, so based on that, Betsy, uh, I would say that those promises still have to be fulfilled. And it appears, based on Revelation 20, it's in a thousand-year period. That being said, that being said, I do understand why some say that when Jesus returns, that's the culmination and we go into eternity. Check out Zechariah 14, all right? After the Lord returns, what happens? Zechariah 14. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to the Line of Fire broadcast, 866-34-TRUTH. Remember, if you follow things on Facebook, Twitter, if you follow me there, connect with me there, you'll know immediately what's happening on the radio, my latest article, my latest post. So just go to AskDrBrown.org. AskDrBrown.org, and then just click right on the home page to get my emails, to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, to, to subscribe to our YouTube videos. Check those out, 866-348-7884. Let's go to Jimmy in North Plainfield, New Jersey. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hello, my, Dr. Michael Brown. My name is Jimmy. Yes, sir. How are you? Well, yeah. Very well. Uh, I've seen... Um, a uh, mid trip, uh, uh, thinking about a mid 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 trip uh, rapture because mm-hmm. you know since Jesus opened the, the scroll, the five seals, you know the seven seals. I can see that in the fifth in the fifth seal, you know the saints are crying out to God to judge the earth because they are suffering persecution uh, for for as a believers, and then we see in the sixth seal that God these people are already with the Lord. Uh, already in heaven with him, you know, with the with the new clothes and white clothes with with the Lord in heaven. And then I see in the seventh seal that the wrath of God is coming to the earth through the seven trumpets, and you know, to 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 put to put out His wrath to the to the mm-hmm. to the evil people in, in the earth. Right. And then in the, in the seven trumpets, I see that God is all, already going to establish His kingdom on the earth. And then we see that Jesus is coming to judge the, the beast and the Antichrist. Right. And he's coming. He's coming with the saints. So I don't know if this is mid trip rapture because we, because we see the saints, you know, yeah. uh, taking out from the air in the sixth seal before Jesus comes to judge. Now the I'll, I'll tell you why it can, it, it's a, it's a great idea, uh, but I tell you why it can't work because First Thessalonians fifteen tells us that we will be transformed, and we will receive eternal life. Right, will be will be uh, will the manifestation of the fullness of eternal life as as we get our resurrected bodies. When will that happen? With the last trumpet, right? That's what Paul says. The last trumpet. So the last trumpet. You've got trumpets in Revelation. What's the seventh trumpet? The seventh trumpet is the one that announces the kingdom of God has come to earth, and the kingdoms of this world have now been displaced by the kingdom of God. So that that happens at the end. In other words, when when is the last trumpet. Matthew 24, he's coming with a trumpet blast. He's going to come with wrath. The whole world's going to see him. He's going to gather his elect together, so we'll be caught up to be with him. When does that happen? It's all the last trumpet. So uh, the, the, those who are under the throne and crying out, those are martyrs who've been martyred either through the ages or specifically at end-time persecution. Uh, but remember, Jesus told us, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So I appreciate your thinking on that, but think it through again, and then look at the end of First uh, Corinthians 15, because the trumpet where we're changed, and First Thessalonians 4 tells us we'll be caught up to meet the Lord at the trumpet blast. That is the last trumpet, and the last trumpet is at the end of the tribulation period. But thank you, sir, for the call. God bless you, dear brother. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Wesley in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Uh, hi, um, I'm a pre-tribu- I'm a pre-tribulation uh, rapture before the tribulation, and um, in the seventy-week prophecy of Daniel nine twenty-four through twenty-seven, it says there's seven and then sixty-two weeks, and then the prince come is gone away. 
people believe in that to be 69 weeks. That's when Christ came and died. And the 70th week being the seven years of tribulation. And um, <clears throat> So here's the, quest, here's the question for you, Wesley. Yes. On what, since, since Daniel is told about everything that's going to happen in the days of the Second Temple, uh, leading up to the destruction of the Second Temple by the Roman leaders, the prince to come, which happens in the 70th week, the Second Temple was destroyed in the year 70. So how can you split that 70th week from the other 69 and just leave it hanging there almost 2,000 years, whereas Daniel was told all of this is going to happen uh, with the destruction of the sec- the rebuilding and the destruction of the Second Temple. Well, the re- the re- I don't believe that um, the destruction of that Second Temple is the temple that's being mentioned there in, in the destruction of it. Uh, but but that, how that but is how is it possible? That... No, no, I understand that. I'm just saying, exegetically reading the text. If I say, okay, I'm talking to Wesley in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Now, Wesley, I just want you to know this, and Wesley, I want you to know this, and Wesley, I want you to know this. That the first time I said Wesley, I meant John Wesley. The second time I said Wesley, I meant you. The third time I said Wesley, I meant Wesley, who's going to be born 8,000 years from now. It becomes completely impossible to, to interpret Scripture then. Daniel was given a vision about the momentous things that would happen in the days of the Second Temple. And, and that's why that 70th week has to be part of that. Otherwise, the words spoken to him become completely meaningless. Okay, well, for instance, the covenant uh, that was confirmed by this one that came, that, that would be the, uh, the Antichrist, after these 70 weeks are complete, all things are reconciled unto Christ. And so Israel but he's and done, the world he, he's, itself has but, not but been he's, he's done that, though. Doesn't it say that in Colossians 1, that he's reconciled through, the, through Jesus things in, in heaven and, and earth, that all things that's have been reconciled? And 2 Corinthians 5 says that, that God's been reconciled through the cross? Yes, that, that's already that's, taken place. See, that's one that's of the... Not, that's not, that's not the, the, the meaning of it when he's speaking to Daniel. He's talking about when he comes, and like you said, in Zechariah 14, it says, I will be king over all the earth, and he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it cracks open. He tells the world they have to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and if they don't celebrate, right, right, but but it does. But notice, up. notice, notice the last week, though. See, you're you're making a whole lot out of a passage that won't sustain it. Okay, it doesn't say any such thing. It says, and after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off, shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happened, sixty-six to seventy, the 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 Jewish war. Its end shall come with a flood. To the end there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. For half the week he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering. And the wings of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out in the desolate. It's just judgment, judgment, judgment. There's nothing there about the universal worship of the Lord in that passage. But Wesley, thanks for calling. Uh, Wish I had time to get to more of your calls, but we did our best to get to as many as possible. And again... I want to stand with you in looking forward to the return of Jesus and laboring with joy and zeal until he appears. Let that be your hope, your call, your life. All right, very quickly, I have a message, politicians, professionals, or prophets that will really minister to you. It'll stir you. It'll put courage, backbone in you, and great if you've got a friend in ministry to give him as a gift. Get this audio message, and as you do, you're helping us be a voice of moral culture revolution. You're literally holding my hands up so that we can be a voice making a difference. Get the audio CD. We'll also give you free with that. My 5 by 7 card, 10 Commitments of a Jesus Revolutionary. Yours for your gift of any size. So everyone, take advantage of this. Call right now, 1-800-278-9978. one 800 278 Nine nine seven eight. One more time. One eight hundred two seven eight nine nine seven eight. My bottom line today: the New Testament talks a lot about the return of Jesus. Are we looking forward to His return with expectation, faith, and anticipation? 